Welcome. I'm Taryn Grohm, co-founder and editor of Pharma Voice. On behalf, all right, easy. <laughs> Thank you. On behalf of Lisa Bankett, Mara Walsh, and the entire Pharma Voice team, we want to welcome you here tonight. And we want to thank you for being here for our second annual Pharma Voice 100 celebration. Pharma Voice, read, think, participate. We had a vision 16 years ago to bring together thought leaders in a forum to address the trends, challenges, and opportunities from molecule to market that we face every day. All of you in this room have helped us achieve that great goal. Thank you. We're excited to be back here again at the beautiful Alexandria Center for Life Science. And we're honored to have so many of our Pharma Voice 100 and Red Jacket honorees with us here tonight. We will be recognizing you all at the conclusion of our exciting panel, creating a culture of innovation moderated by Dr. Amir Kalali, who is joined by Kathy Juisty, Craig Lipset, Melinda Richter, and Mike Ria, who bring a diverse range of perspectives to this important topic. Innovation, it's an often used word, but what does it mean and to what end for patients who are the focus of what you do every day? Our world-class panel of experts will define how they are viewing innovation and what it takes to create a culture of innovation for sustainable success. At the conclusion of the panel, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A, so jot down your questions. Before I introduce our executive forum sponsor, Julie Camp, founder, CEO, and chief possibilities officer, is there a better title than that? <laughs> of JBK Associates International, I would like to acknowledge all of our sponsors. Our diamond sponsor, JBK Associates International. Our, yes, absolutely. Our platinum sponsor, Medidata. Our gold sponsors, Context Health Media. Guidemark Health. Ogilvy Common Health Worldwide. Publicis Health. And United Biosource Corporation. Our silver sponsors, Alexandria Real Estate Equities, Beringer Ingelheim, Calcium, Precision Effects, Synovian Pharmaceuticals, Target Health Inc. And our bronze sponsor, HCB Health. Thank you all so very much. I am now pleased to introduce Julie Kampf, as noted before, our sponsor of this executive forum, and someone I am honored to call a friend. Through passion, energy, and a commitment to diversity, Julie has created an award-winning executive talent solutions organization that pushes the boundaries way beyond the limitations of traditional executive search. Um, please join me in welcoming 2013 and 2009 Pharma Voice 100 honoree Julie Kampf. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us here tonight for this incredible celebration. Everyone talks about the next innovation, what it will be, and how it will happen. I've been thinking about the question of why. Why do we do what we do? Simon Sinek wrote a bestseller based on the idea that true success starts with knowing why you get out of bed in the morning. In life sciences, the answer is never just to make a living. Our why is personal. In my case, my mother died of ovarian cancer when I was 15, and every woman in my family on my mother's side has either had breast, ovarian, or uterine cancer. I myself have the BRCA gene, and I'm the beneficiary of technology and advancements created by people in the life sciences. Your work has not only changed my life, it probably has saved my life. What gets me out of bed in the morning is the chance to help companies advance the world and make the lives of millions of people better. In my work, I see that everybody wants to move at the speed of sound. That's especially true in the life sciences, where pressures include an aging patient population that urgently needs new medicines and devices, and a regulatory environment that makes getting anything to market an arduous process. 
In my line of work, it's a tight executive talent market that's getting even tighter as the baby boomers retire. The people who meet these challenges know how to focus on their larger purpose, and I see them on our panel. Kathy Giusti is also a multiple myeloma patient. Craig Lipset used data to understand his own diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Melinda Richter founded her passion for this industry in a near-death experience. And Mike Rea defines innovation as being about delivering patient value and tolerates no BS when it comes to walking our talk. You can't fake that sense of purpose. It's the thing that keeps you going no matter what and that inspires your teams to do what they're doing better, stronger, and faster. If you're in this room right now, you've been called to this field for a reason. I hope you get up each day with your own larger purpose in mind and surround yourself with all the others that do the same. I don't know what the great next innovation will be. It may depend on technology and science that only a few people understand, but I do know that it does come from the commitment of people who recognize, as Hippocrates did, that wherever the art of medicine is loved, there is also the love of humanity. That's what drives the best people in life sciences, and I am in awe of each of you. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, someone who is passionate about improving medical research through collaboration and innovation, the head of the Neuroscience Center for Excellence for Quintiles, Dr. Amir Kalali. Thank you. Well, what a great way to kick off the evening. That was an excellent introduction. Thank you. Uh, I noticed Taryn actually does, has done us a few favors, not only a great introductory talks. Uh, my Fitbit's only got exercise doing the clapping, so I think we've hacked our, <laughs> hacked our Fitbit's and Apple Watches, and they'll think we took extra steps. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll hit my, hit my goal early. So, um, you know, uh, the word innovation, as we've already said, is kind of, you hear it a lot, don't we? And the question is, is there anything else we can possibly say about it? You can be kind of skeptical about that word uh, because of its overuse. So we had a pre-call, you know, to talk about it, uh, and apparently there is plenty to say about it. In fact, I think uh, we could have gone on for six days, really, talking about these things. So my challenge, really, is in the time we have, how do I get this excellent panel to kind of be within time and to really hit the highlights. There's so much else we can talk about. But I'll get going and we're hoping to have Q&A at the end so you guys can also heckle us and uh, you know, give, give us your uh, opinion of things. Um, so the first thing we're going to start with is really think about how you define innovation. What does that mean? And I wonder if I could ask the panel, each of them, just to briefly tell us what does innovation mean to them that word. So I'm going to start with Mike at the end, if that's OK, and ask him to go first. What does it mean to you, the, the word innovation? I feel like I should avoid BS now, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> um, so uh, we've got a very strict definition, which is innovation is what you launch. It isn't what you invent. It isn't what you create. It's about <coughs> what you launch. And, um, and when we came up with the Productive Innovation Index as a way of ranking pharmaceutical companies for their ability to launch innovation, it was based on that belief that you have to deliver meaningful medicines to patients. That's it. Everything else is BS. Um, until, <laughs> until you get to the point of delivering value. And so the, the definition of innovation that we apply is a very strict one, which is, do you get there? Do you get on first, as they, in the money ball expression, or you know, whatever it is? So when we started ranking pharmaceutical companies, it's very easy. There are objective measures of how good they are at launching innovation. Um, and our definition is you know, robust. Uh, you can't game it. If you don't launch medicines, you can't claim to be an innovator. So that's... I guess, applying the absence of BS to the, uh, the definition of innovation. Okay. So I'm going to challenge that a bit later, but I'm going to let Melinda come, come well, in. Well, let me say as well, so the, the company that came top uh, throughout that seven-year period that we've been doing that has been J&J, &J, and when we first ranked J&J &J number one, it was like, J&J, &J, are you kidding? J&J &J aren't the innovate, innovators. Cause That's just somebody like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause they're, cause Sorry, they're, Pfizer. They're not the ones who... <laughs> They weren't the words that said innovation a lot, but actually they were the ones that were, that were doing the best at launching meaningful medicines to, to patients, mm -hmm. and they've been top for the last four years. So, mm. over to you. Well, you know, it's an interesting uh, question, what is innovation? Because where you're at on the value chain, for me, is so early that you have to take so many bets 
that are so risky, it's like, well, how are you going to know if it's going to reach the patient? Mm -hmm. And so that's why we created a, a, an innovation in a, in a way of looking at innovation uh, through JLab. So our goal is to increase the volume, the velocity, and the quality of early stage innovation uh, externally to J&J &J so that we have many more shots on goal. I'm Canadian, so you'll hear some hockey references in there. So we create more shots on goal that have the possibility of actually being viable commercial entities that can get solutions to patients and to consumers. And so for us, we look at not just products and solutions, and, and, and you look at signposts that, that tell you you're on the right road to get to the right end goal, right? So is it remarkable science and technology? Is it a rock star team? And a rock star team isn't necessarily just experienced scientific founders, but they're really young, dynamic founders that if you pair them with the experience and wisdom of experts within a larger corporation, can they do remarkable things? And, and then you look at, is this a critical unmet need, right? So you've got to take some bets and you look at all those things and, and it's kind of a numbers game. And you also have to look at, it's not just about products, right? Sometimes innovation is about other things. So I don't know if any of you went to business school, but there's this, this thing called the innovation radar. And in it, the innovation radar, if you Google it, you'll get a great visual. So I promise you, you put this in your notes, you bring it up in a panel conversation, you will be a hit. Innovation radar, it's not just about what you do. It's about where you do it, for who you do it, why you do it, how you do it. So all of those things matter, right? So for us, even in JLabs, is a different way of how and to who that we do it. So innovation at the early stage is a little bit different and you have to be courageous. You have to be courageous about choosing those things and choosing different paths in the hopes that you can get more things down the line. Um, because it is so hard to get to where Mike is talking about. And, and that's why you have to be brave up front with a long, patient view of what you can get out of the back end. Because, because you know, to your points, Julie, uh, it's about the patient. And it requires us to have that kind of courage to say, that's what we're doing it for. Now, I will give you kudos for using the word courage in the same month that Apple used it. So I'm pretty <laughs> impressed by that. <laughs> so, uh, Craig, what does innovation mean to you? I think the idea of, of bringing medicines to patients in need is the mission that most all of us wake up with every day. And the idea that that would be the desired goal for everything we do makes, makes great sense. But for me to motivate and inspire and challenge the folks in various disciplines in my own organization, um, I ha at least from my work, it has to be more granular than that. For me, innovation is an idea from which you derive value. And we define it that simply. And we do that quite deliberately. Ideas, we all have. Everyone in this room has ideas. If I have tens of thousands of employees, I have tens of thousands of ideas. That's not innovation in and of itself, I think, similar to what um, was just said a moment ago. The challenge is actually finding a way to get value out of it. Now, at the end of the day, for uh, an integrated biopharmaceutical company, th that value is getting a launch. It's getting a medicine through. But for all of those steps that happen in between, that great idea that somebody has about their process, their part of the business, clinical trials overall, that idea has to derive some sort of value. You have to bring it to life. You have to have some sort of impact of that idea. And then you get to wave the flag that you are innovative. We can't just sit back and have ideas all day. I'm not going to be employed very long if I sit back and just have ideas all day. The hard part of the business of innovation is actually curating those and bringing those to life so that you can get value wherever you are in the organization. Thank you. So, Kathy, what does innovation mean to you? You know, I'm actually going to steal from Jeff Huber from Grail, who was speaking here yesterday at the Alexandria Summit. And um, the quote he gave was, innovation happens at intersections. 
And it, it really made me think right, because, in all honesty, when I look at what's happening today, you look at the world of science, which is just exploding like we've never seen before, whether it's genomics, immune, um, wherever it may be. And then you're intersecting that with technology, which is the digitization of data and the cloud has transformed everything. And intersect that in a Venn diagram with the consumerism of healthcare where patients and participants are getting so much more engaged in their care. I feel like we are never going to see a time as transformative as today. And I think today brings just tremendous hope for so many people, but only if we create those intersections and the collaborations that truly will drive disruption and innovation for the patients that we're here to represent. Kathy, you really bring up a good point because I right now describe it as the third wave of technology. So technology companies have invented the internet, that was the first wave. Second wave was Facebook, you know, photo apps, things that didn't have regulation, things that really were not that hard to break into. I think the third wave is now technology companies really thinking about healthcare and life sciences. Right. And I think that intersection, you know, learning from each other, there's challenges at that intersection, mm -hmm. right? But I absolutely agree with you that, you know, that's going to really change everything in life sciences. Yeah. I think we have seen, like, just as um, the founder of the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, everything that we had to do was generating a critical mass of data. The, the disease was fatal. Nobody cared about it. It was very uncommon. So we had to get everybody to start sharing. But in today's world, we've now, as a foundation, it's strange, we were smiling about this as a nonprofit, we are now one of the biggest data companies out there in terms of the amount of genomic sequencing, clinical data, longitudinal data that we have funded and paid for, and how do we create this reservoir that everybody can bring in their APIs, ask the question whether you're a payer, a pharma company, or anybody else, put all that data in the public domain so we can answer your questions quickly on behalf of the patient. And I think in today's world where we struggle a little bit more is getting the prioritization of the questions. What are we really trying to answer? Because the data can be used to drive drug development. What's a new target? What's a new approach for a pharma company? But in myeloma, we've been fortunate with success of 10 drugs approved. Now we're saying, gosh, how do we use these 10 drugs? You know, why are we all look different genomically? Why are we all starting on the same standard of care? And so I think as we start to understand all that, we're going to uncover so many secrets of these diseases. So, Kathy, again, you bring up a really big issue that we may talk about later if we have time. When we had our sort of pre-call before, the issue of data sharing really was a big issue. Um, I don't know how many of you, um, hands up if you, around about February, were aware of kind of a scandal uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine about an editorial about data. Christine, you put your hand up if you know what I'm talking about. New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, not that many people, so let me tell you in one minute. So the editor of New England Journal of Medicine with a co-author read an editorial where they basically said that, I'm paraphrasing to be quick, that people who want our data from academia to do their own analysis are data parasites that we were the ones that came up with the idea for a grant, we're the ones who collected this data, and these guys just want to walk in and take it away from us, that's being a parasite. You can imagine the reaction from the data scientists and the, and the idea of, well, what is the data for? Is it for academic advancement or the patients? So it's a hot topic. We may or may not get to it, but do you want to say something, Craig? Or? Well, and how about the, the reaction of the data scientists, the reaction of the patients? Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I didn't <laughs> submit my data into the research study yes. so you could advance your career. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Um, so that's a very big topic we may get to maybe explore maybe in the Q&A. But I'll, I'll move on from that was our first question, what's our definition? I'm going to focus the next one uh, mainly on Craig and Melinda because you two work for large organizations. Um, so the whole uh, evening is about creating a culture of innovation. You guys bo both work in large organizations. Maybe I'll start with you, Melinda. How does one try and help create a culture of innovation in a large organization? Uh, I have to say one of the things that I am most proud of, in addition to creating J Labs and these young, dynamic teams that are doing remarkable things, uh, is the culture change that's happening at J&J. &J. And one of the reasons that there's a cultural change that ha that's happening is because we're inviting them in to be a part of the process. So one of the 
stories I love to tell, and I have many of these, but I'll just tell one, is a, a, a company called Zycrobe. Uh, Alex Gorski, our CEO, came to San Diego, and I had a bunch of companies I wanted him to meet. One was Zycrobe, and it was this young guy from Yale, and this guy's wicked smart, right? So he's sitting across from Alex, and Alex saying, so tell me what you do. And this guy just lights up the room with the microbiome. And uh, Alex said, uh, and we had just signed a deal with him that day. And uh, these two guys had come from Yale. They graduated, never had a real job in their life. Uh, wanted to start a company in San Diego because they could surf there um, and apply to J Labs. And, and uh, when they applied, they had this thing that they were wanting to do. And we were like, well, that's really nice. But if you want to do something that's going to have an impact, in the industry, I would focus it on A, B, and C. And so they went into the lab and they focused it on that. And then a year later, we did a collaboration. And uh, so Alex said to these two young guys, uh, so what did J-Labs mean to you? And they said, well, we wouldn't be here. We, there would be no Zycrobe and there would be no collaboration because we had a, you know, we had a good idea, but you had mentors from J&J that came in and you helped us focus on what we needed to do. And because of that, we got a collaboration, and we have a real shot at having an impact for patients. And of course, Alex, you know, straightened up. He's like, "Yeah, we did that." You know. <laughs> but the real gem in all of this is what it's doing for the people inside of J and J who get to work with them. So for many, many years, you know, working at a big company, you get told no a lot. You get told to stay in your little box. And suddenly, these people who've been there for a long time get a chance to work with these young, dynamic teams. And I think that's the real potential in the industry. Well, listen, we all want to figure out how to make the most of this new millennial generation that's coming out. We're thinking, wow, there's going to be such creativity there. There's going to be so much productivity there. And yet, inside of these large organizations are high quality, experienced people that because they've been put in a box for so long, do the nine to five hi ho hi ho. But there's so much value there that if we unlocked that and we paired it together with the potential of these young dynamic teams, we could blow it out. And that's, that's what we need to do in this industry. We talk about tech, right? I'm here to techify this industry and I promise you we have not come close to reaching the potential of what this industry can do because we need to unlock those boxes. And if we do that, I see a massive, massive impact for patients. I see a lot of nods in the audience with that. So. That's a tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll say, you know, I guess if we just wanted a bunch of millennials, I, I would create a pokey stop at our headquarters. <laughs> yeah. the road. Yeah. I'm sure there is one already. There probably actually. is. Yeah, we have a Starbucks and it probably is. Um, I'll, sh I'll just share a story because I think that's a nice way to, uh, to, to drive the conversation. Um, we had launched a program last year to try to um, increase the utilization of, of exciting new mobile tools in our development programs, um, whether uh, e-consent or mobile apps for participants or uh, novel types of wearables and sensors. And, you know, we took kind of a, a very pragmatic and disciplined approach. We said we were going to uh, create a pool of some additional resources and go to some uh, early adopter studies and kind of hold their hands and help those study teams to use these tools and we'll give them the extra resource to, to be able to do that and we'll learn from those and take what learn, we learned and scale things up appropriately. And, and so it was a very typical kind of push, right? We, we showed up, we said, we'll help you and they said, fine, as long as you don't hurt us, you go do what you wanna do and, and we did it. And what we didn't expect was the, uh, the degree and the energy of fast followers of other study teams that said, wait a minute, I want that. And we said, well, we don't have you know, the extra people to kind of help you. You would kind of actually have to do work to use those tools. And they said, that's fine. We want it too. And one thing that we, we took away from that experience, well, there were a few. But uh, this may not surprise you, and, and maybe it shouldn't have surprised us. When we would engage with the teams that we had fully supported and said, well, what really worked? What didn't work about these tools? They, there was just a lot of silence on the phone. They weren't engaged. They, they, it was kind of like healthcare if you don't put skin in the game, 
right? You're just kind of sitting there and things are happening, right? And that's the way it was when, when we were centrally supporting all of the tools for those teams. But for the guys that followed, for the guys that really took ownership, that said, I want that, and saw it, and then they wanted that too, oh, forget it. We learned so much from those teams because they were engaged. They had skin in the game, they owned it, and they were the ones that really helped us to fine tune and perfect what we were doing to be able to scale it. We didn't anticipate all those folks. We're kind of used to having to go out and pushing ideas and convincing teams that it's okay to do it. But to start to see a, a culture pivot where people are excited and want to use those tools, even if it's a little extra work for them, that was phenomenal, and that's something I'm very excited about seeing now. So, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think, you know, when you're running some of the smaller companies, there still is um, a little bit of the old school, which is making sure you understand the vision of where you want to go, and it is so clearly articulated from the uh, top down. And when you know that, you're hiring mm. from the bottom up to bring in that creativity. But I think in today's world, especially when you're trying to be entrepreneurial, the, the science and everything is changing so fast that you can't hire that talent. I mean, it would be crazy for an organization like ours to hire everybody who's the best in immune or genomics or data and, and biotechnology, all those things. So we have to outsource everything. And I think the most important thing you can do is bring the outside in and make sure you're bringing the most creative people in to partner with your company to keep it really efficient. Mike, did you have any comments? Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we see lots of companies that talk about innovation and don't deliver, and the question is why. And I think Melinda's exactly right that there are, you know, we've got this phrase that we use at IDEA, which is people don't need process to be innovative, they need permission. Yeah. And we had this interesting thing yesterday, which is we were running a meeting with a bunch of small biotechs like CRISPR and, you know, interesting Gritstone Oncology and some interesting companies. Uh, and as an aside, I, I own a record label. It's really interesting. There's an old guy trying to run a record oh, he label. He just made us all look not cool. <laughs> um, Thanks, Sam. And the interesting thing is there's no point trying to be a 50-year-old trying to run a record label. You've got to talk to people that are buying music, and they're not all 50-year-olds. Um, and the interesting thing is that a lot of the people that we were introducing to the small biotechs yesterday wanted to learn from them. How are they doing things differently? And to, to your point, it's, it's entirely energizing for them to be able to do things in weeks and months that would take years to do at a large pharma company. And they said, you know, we did this in four weeks, and the guys standing around that were from large pharma were like, well, we couldn't even get a meeting together in four weeks. <laughs> yeah. we, we need to, we, you know, six month cycles just to get calendars coordinated and say, well, what's the difference, right? And the difference is that energy and the people that can do it. Um, and they said, well, who's going to be more successful in the future? The, the experimentation, that kind of multiple bets. Do you want to have them all going through one casino or do you want to put them in several different places? And that culture, I think, is it's about permission. It's about deciding that we're going to be experimental rather than the old way is the best way and we're going to run everything through the old system. There's lots of different competing systems. And as Kathy says, you start to think about it the way we do, which is you get an early phase and you think, well, what about digital? What about diagnostics? What about you know, precision medicine? What about the other possibilities? What about data or genomics? And then, well, we need to put that in early because it's never going to come out if we try and add it late. Um, and we need to run lots of experiments. So we're an industry that's comfortable with experimentation in one way, and then we forget about experimentation in everything else that we do. And you know, the biggest issue I have with innovation is we tend to think about it in the discovery piece. I think, well, we need to innovate everything else. Mm -hmm. Business models, we need to innovate, right. you know, the way that we engage with people and, you know, people with disease, regulators. And we need to start thinking about that as, I think, the challenge rather than just the new way to put more in at the front end of the system. So, so let me follow up on that. <clears throat> when we talked earlier, I mean, I always uh, have a sort of pet peeve, which is when we think about our industry, which is an industry with data and science at the center of it, mm -hmm. we really don't spend any money on the R&D of the D. So uh, if, you, you know, if you look at the tech industry, they do quite, spend quite a bit of money on that. But we, whenever you ask questions, you know, why is it we do it this way? The answer is, well, we've always done it Because we've way. always done right? it. Right? Yeah. We've always done it. And we actually, uh, part of a society I'm involved in, we did a actual, we tried to do a Cochrane, basically, approach to methodology in clinical trials. Well, we couldn't because Cochrane has very high standards for something. So we had to go to what's something called the modified Oxford, which is like a really watered down Cochrane to see the levels of evidence for things we do in development. And the levels of what's four and five, extremely low levels, if any, 
evidence base for what we do in development. Mm -hmm. And yet you would think, I mean, that's what break, makes or breaks it, right? So mm -hmm. this is a big deal for us, I think, where we really need to do better. I mean, let me give you an example. So last month, talking to a big pharma company, we said, look, we think there's an issue with TPPs, with the way you make decisions. Everyone knows that NPVs are wrong. So, so why don't you try at least one other parallel way of making decisions? And they went, well, what if it's better? Like, yeah, and? <laughs> 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 what would you do then? Well, then we'd have to break everything that we've ever done as an organization. And, went, and that's a problem because of what? I went, you know, and you can just see this anxiety in the face of people that got where they are by doing TPPs and MPVs and decision every six months. And suddenly, if you start to think differently, the pace that people are making decisions in tech, you know, someone said yesterday there are 450 different AI programs going on at Google at the moment in separate divisions with separate entrepreneurs mm. uh, funding them and working in them. Where are we in comparison to that tech space? Yeah. So. Mm. Absolutely. Well, in that case, too, it, they make a very competitive environment, yeah. right? Yeah. Whereas sometimes in big companies, it's like, how are we all aligned? You know, yeah. I think yeah. we have a bit of... I have a bit of an allergic reaction to the word alignment now. It's like, okay, do we all need to be aligned or can we try a bunch of different yeah. experiments? So Melinda, you sort of, uh, my next question, you're going straight to it, which is what roles do collaboration and competition play? Not just within the company, just also without. So what, I'll start with you, uh, Kathy. Well, I think what we find in healthcare is that the continuum is getting so broad at this mm -hmm. point. So, you know, it used to be, okay, well, we're working with pharma, we're working, you know, in these specific areas. Now you're sitting there, you're going, okay, I've got to understand everything about data. I've got to understand the stats. I've got to understand diagnostics. I've got to understand imaging. I've got to understand the payer. And so everybody's looking at this entire continuum with a different lens. And, you know, nobody's looking at it from the full spectrum. So I think the most important thing we can do is bring the people together, the disruptors together, that actually work in those spaces and decide how do we end up finding where the value is. And it was discussed before, like, how do you actually get these groups to play together? And an example is we can't get anybody to share data, even in an uncommon disease like myeloma. And then ironically, it hit me the other day that one space that everybody was sharing, that a pharmaceutical companies were giving their data, the academic centers were, we were doing the same thing and FDA was involved, was we were using minimal residual disease and when patients get into a complete remission, could we use MRD as a surrogate endpoint? And what you realized in that situation was everybody had skin in the game and value. A patient didn't want to be on a drug if they didn't have to be. Pharma was fair in understanding when would they put patients on maintenance drugs or not. And the payers didn't want to pay for things that they didn't have to. And so all of a sudden, when we're all trying to find you know, data sharing models, this one was just happening you know, seamlessly. And so you have to keep your eye on the landscape and just be very aware of when the value is seen by every party in the continuum and how do you create leaders that can drive that forward? And then how do we all learn from each other in that space too? Okay. Any other thoughts about collaboration versus competition? Well, I spent um, the better part of the week uh, this week with the folks at Transcelerate. And you know, when you think about what they're doing and you, you can start to say, well, where, where, where are the limits? Right? If, if you take that development space and you say, well, if we can share comparator drug and we can share contact information for investigator sites and we can share placebo data and we can share and we can share, we could share and run studies off of a common protocol template. Well, then you look at models like LungMap and iSpy2 yeah. and you say, well, why are we running all these studies mm -hmm. again in parallel with one another? Mm -hmm. Right. If we're all going to use a, a common protocol template and exchange comparator drug and all that other infrastructure, well, and we, we've got data standards and all these other initiatives, um, uh, where are the limits of collaboration? And in that future state, why can't we run more master protocols and umbrella protocols and, 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 and right. reduce all of that redundant infrastructure and overhead? So, Craig, don't you think that's actually an ethical argument of not wasting research dollars? It always seems to me that just makes plain sense, right? Wow. Even from an ethical perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know usually that. <laughs> <laughs> ethical and sensible. Yeah. I, um, yeah, and if I could add, I think that the, there's, a, there's an interesting thing, right, which is you ask the question, do we think the future is certain or uncertain? Everyone says, yeah, of course it's uncertain. All of our processes are set up for certainty. 
the setup for predictability and certainty. But what would we do if no one knows the answer? Mm -hmm. Because currently we're out there looking for the person who has the answer, and we bring them in and we give them the, the chance to say, well, what, well, we need to collaborate. If no one has the answer, we've all got a little piece of it. And that's the point is, and then you look at the way that companies are set up, and you know, when we started the innovation index, the basic question was, if you gave the same molecule to two different companies, would they be equally successful? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no, clearly. We all know that's right. And uh, so we'll, and then you go back and we'll ask the next question, well, why don't companies themselves give the same molecule to two different teams within the same company? They go, oh, that's interesting. Ooh, but we couldn't possibly do that. And you go, well, that competition, that mm. collaborate, that's happening in the industry. Just doesn't, it isn't allowed to happen within a company. Well, so, and I yeah. think we're, we're doing it more now. So to your question about collaboration and, and competition. So from a collaboration perspective, what we've been doing differently is saying, let's reach out to that. Let's think about talent differently, right? Mm -hmm. So our talent is now defined as anybody who's on the same mission as us. Yeah. Whether you are a full-time employee as a label or you're an entrepreneur or an innovator, it actually doesn't matter. You are on the same mission with us, so you deserve the same sort of resources. So if you are an employee, you prefer to have a more stable, secure environment. And I get that. Many people need that. Their circumstances in life and who they are, they need that. It's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Let's get the best of those. And then there's certain people who like that risk and reward to be like, I'll put it all in because I want a lot more on the back end and I'm willing to ride on that. And they're, they have a personality for that and they want to ride that road. That's good for them too. They should all be in our talent pool, right? Now the beauty is to put them together. Like how do you leverage the one with the other so you can bring out the best in both? And when you do that, well, you might be able to leverage a lot more than you thought possible before. And in addition to that, create that sense of competition. Well, you'll have some internal groups working on this. Well, let's get some external groups working on that. And let's start to compare them on the same metrics. And let's start to give them the tools to look at it in the same way and present it to us in the same way. Well, you want that more secure thing? You can have it and yet you can still do it in a different way. So I think what we're seeing is more of a leveling of the playing field, right? So for us, for the innovators, we're giving them the same sort of resources that our internal R&D teams have, so they don't have the same hurdles most entrepreneurs face. We want them to focus on the science and accelerate it. And they may win big or they may go bust. And on the same time over here, we want to give them a little bit more freedom freedom to explore different things. And, you know, it's a bit more of a stable environment, so they're not going to go uh, big or go bust, but they're going to have the opportunity to, to explore as much as they can within that parameter. So I think it's very interesting. I think the way we're thinking about the world of work is changing. If I can, Amir, and one build on that that I think will resonate with Kathy. Um, usually when I'm in this building, Pfizer's lab upstairs here is our uh, Centers for Therapeutic Innovation, and it's a collaborative um, laboratory space with about six different uh, universities here around the New York area. And when they first brought folks from Rockefeller and folks from NYU and Columbia and Mount Sinai into one space, they're all happy to work with Pfizer. But wait a minute, those guys are going to be at the bench next to us? And so, you know, breaking down not the barriers between companies around data sharing, but those other stakeholders. Yeah. You mentioned earlier around the ethics of data sharing. Mm -hmm. um, just not to dwell on Transcelerate, I just had it on the mind. There's an initiative in Transcelerate around placebo data sharing. Um, at Pfizer, we recently were able to reduce the number of placebo arm patients in a stroke study by reusing placebo data from Novo. Right? So, yeah, it saved us probably some money in the process, but stroke patients who didn't have to be exposed to a placebo. Right. But we can only do that in a phase two study right now for our own decision making. Mm. We can't do that to support a registration yet. And so, I mean, those are amazing examples of what like minded organizations can do around data that is good for the company, it's good for the patient. That's great. So we've only got halfway through the questions that we had, and I see we have about <laughs> two minutes to go. I had lots of questions about tech companies, are they going to disrupt pharma, can pharma disrupt itself, all sorts of things. But with only two minutes to go, uh, 
I was, we can go a bit more, we're allowed? Okay, Taran gives the go ahead, okay. So uh, maybe the last question is, can we innovate from the inside or do you think it's outsiders are gonna change R&D in life sciences? Because there's this myth in Silicon Valley that only they can really disrupt industries, you know, they can't do it themselves. How many people have a new Samsung in their pockets? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, well, we're gonna put I don't you think it's fire. mutually <laughs> exclusive. I have to be honest, for us, um, and I think one of the areas that we were, we were evaluating was, you know, when you're trying to get data, you're trying to get it from an academic center, the community centers, and you're also trying to get it from the patients. And so one of the things we were evaluating is, how do we go directly to the consumer to understand, will they give data? How do we create brands of awareness and engage them, retain them, and do all the right things? And what I found so intriguing was, you know, I, I work up at Harvard Business School half time now, and so we brought in the graduates, like the CEO of Rent the Runway. She is actually going to work with the people in the healthcare sector to understand how does Rent the Runway use every bit of data to tell you what dress, what accessory, what season, what holiday you're gonna use. How does, we're bringing in Uber, how do they use their data? Because, you know, one of the things we were talking about is I think it's horrible that somebody can find the perfect shoe or tell me the perfect route to take on Waze, but you cannot tell me what trial. And that means that we have not learned in healthcare from other sectors. It doesn't mean other sectors can't learn from us either. But what I do find is people, especially, the world is kind. And so, you know, these people, when you call them and say, you actually could take your unbelievable marketing and data skills and help us cure cancer, and, and ask them, will they join in? They go, how could I say no? How could I ever say no? And I think that's the beauty of trying mm -hmm. to go across industries and finding the right people mm -hmm. to work with. Can I just build on that? Um, I don't, and no, if many of you know, the reason I got into the industry was because I was a patient. I had been in the tech industry, and I had been living in China at the time because it was the gold rush of telecoms to be in China. And uh, at the time, we were trying to figure out how to order a soda from the vending machine with my cell phone, right? And yet, here I get bit by a bug, and you cannot take a blood test and figure out what I have? Like, how is that possible? How could we as a society be okay with all this money and press and talent going over here to something so frivolous when there are some pretty basic human healthcare gaps going on over here? And that was what changed my life, right? I was gonna get in the industry and I was going to change it. And, and, and you look at it from a basic perspective of how you commercialize in the tech industry versus the life science industry. In the tech industry, you give a couple of guys a couple of computers and a couple hundred thousand dollars and a couple years later, they can turn around and sell that to Microsoft or Yahoo or Google for $200 million. Mm -hmm. Simple and quick and cheap and easy, just like that, right? Just like a rap song. In the life science industry, it takes you at least a year to get the funding you need, to get your permits in place, to get your equipment, to get your, your operations going, and then eight to 12 years to get a drug to market and billions of dollars. So from an entrepreneur's perspective, who in their right mind would start a life science company, right? So for me, it was about changing that paradigm to make it just as, I hate to say it, but cheap and quick and easy to start a life science company as a tech company and make it just as cool, right? It's time to make it cool so the best talent that's out there is just as motivated to get into this industry from both a return perspective and an investment perspective and from a coolness factor, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to techify it because they got the equation right. Right? And we can learn a lot from it, and I think we've, gone a, we've come a long way, even in the last five years, I think we've come a long way, and we've got a long ways to go. Um, <laughs> and that's where I think we all need to take some lessons from other industries, including services industry, right? We need to become more solutions-based, not just I have this product, but what is the entire solution? How do I prevent disease? How do I intercept disease? Then how do I cure disease, right? <laughs> And, and I know our commercial folks don't like to hear about the prevention thing because they're like, Melinda, how do we make money off of that? Uh, but that's the right thing to do and the business model will follow, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's so much left to learn, but we've come a long way. Yeah. Well, bio is definitely cool in silicon in my opinion. Go ahead, Mike. No, I think, so you asked the question, can we do it from inside or are we gonna get disrupted yeah. from outside? I think that um, you know, the essential question is, 
have our possibilities expanded. And they're expanding exponentially, right? They're expanding everywhere. Well, why would we allow Google or Samsung or somebody else to take advantage of that stuff? Because those possibilities are there for us too. I think the question is, do we want to? And there are many companies that are set up to not change things very much, just a little bit incrementally. Uh, and are they ready to do it? So yes, we can. Do we want to? Not every company wants it the same way, that, and they are thinking differently. And, you know, kudos to Melinda. I've seen the culture change that's happened to J and J almost as a result of her. Never mind just the, you know, the, the the guys at the top wanting to be changed as well. And I think that appetite for disruption sounds like a Guns and Roses album, right? <laughs> um, that, that, that appetite for disruption isn't shared equally amongst all the pharma companies. Some of them want to, you know, we talk about innovation. A lot of in, a lot of pharma companies wanted to be gentle and top down not bottom up, you know, that's the way they prefer it, that's the way it's always been. But the most successful companies in our industry are only launching two, two products a year. You know, some are only launching one every two years if they're doing okay. We're not launching a lot of medicines. There's a lot we could do differently. Yeah. I think leaders today love flying out to Mountain View, Cupertino, and everywhere else that's glitzy and sexy. And why not? I mean, they are exciting places and they're developing really cool products. Are they going to completely disrupt so that Quintiles and Pfizer aren't going to be here in, in five or ten years? I'm going to drop a chip and say no. But um, if, if you want to ask me who is that disruptive force that's going to change the way we do our business, at least where I sit in development, it's already happening and it's every one of us, the patients who are around us. It's the patients with access to their data who want to use their data in innovative and novel ways to share their data in ways that it's never been done before. And it's companies that have suddenly transformed to shut up and listen and then talk and engage and actually talk to patients about priorities, about endpoints, about unmet need, about optimizing their study design for the science that the patients care about, but also the participation that the patients are looking for. Those are the companies that are gonna win. They're gonna use big data and awesome tools out of Silicon Valley along the way, but if they're not engaging with patients and empowering and encouraging through policy or technology, encouraging that, that their patients have that access to data, to do these awesome things, those are the ones that are going to win in this space. Thank you. I think we're going to move on to Q&A, right? If yeah. you're ready. Yeah. OK. We could go on for another six hours. I know. Just, yeah. I think, <laughs> but I think we have drinks and food. No, drinks and food, yeah. yes, involved. I wouldn't so, want to be the one to stop that. So. And I wouldn't want you to be the one to yeah. stop that. This is a crowd. Um, maybe we can turn up the lights. And while we do that, we'll ask the folks who are standing in the back if you want to find a seat. There's some seats up here. Or if you're comfortable back there, that's OK, too. Um, so I heard tonight there was a lot of great sound bites. Um, ideation for value, long-term view and courage. Innovation happens at an intersection and curate ideas for value. And the third wave of technology is here. So um, we have a couple of folks in the aisles and we have handheld mics. So um, raise your hand if you have a question, but I'd like to get uh, started with just one. And I'm gonna start with Amir. Um, in addition to completely changing the way meetings are run, as evident by your upcoming CNS summit, it's going to blow it up. What innovation are you most excited about? Well, that's a hard question, isn't it? I mean, one can think of hundreds of things. So I didn't say I, it was going to be easy. Just go no. ahead. <laughs> so instead of picking a te cool technology or something, I would say what would excite me most would be innovation in the culture of pharma. So that will, that will excite me most. If we could really make some of the cultural changes we need to make, that will be my answer. Kathy? Oh, I'm sorry, you were asking each of the speakers. Yes. Yep. I'm going to ask you all. <laughs> surprise time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going I'm to go with the patient. I'm going to say that the advancement of patients and, and participants taking on a much larger role. Right? Sync for science, data donation, the ability for patients with unprecedented access to their electronic health data to share that data to advance research. And when you think about how you develop your medicines today with all the cost and time of redundant data capture, paying for people to sit and transcribe data that already was captured electronically somewhere, the patients have access to it. And as they now have access to that data and their willingness to share it to advance research, that will change drug development, it will change 
um, it'll change research and development overall. Uh, so there's so many exciting areas. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, because I, I started my career in the tech industry and I'm in the life science industry, and I'm seeing the intersection of the two, and yet I don't think they really either one quite get each other yet. And I don't see a clear digital health strategy from anyone, to be honest, not even us. I think that's where the money shot is because we, if we learn to harness all the possibilities, whether it's data or how we do things, et cetera, uh, in health through technology, I think big things can happen. Um, so I, I would put my money there. Well, it's an interesting question. So I was going to say Savaldi just because someone launched a cure when they could have launched an incremental change, and I think that was meaningful. Mm. But actually, I think that the, the thing that's changing things the most is the presence of money that isn't coming from pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. funds. Because that's changing who gets funded, how they get funded, what their business models can be. So you don't have to make money in the first year, you might be making money in five years time, or you might be buying data, or, and actually you think about the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and, and, and people like Kathy that are able to change the way that research happens and the insights mm -hmm. happen and, and needs are captured. I think actually the way that money flows through the system might be one of the biggest innovations mm -hmm. that's gonna disrupt our industry. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a nice, uh, interesting range of answers. Thank you very much, panel. That was certainly fascinating for me. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. So. We're happy to take questions from the audience. CC yes. Zach. Thank you all. Absolutely fascinating to hear the diverse um, opinions, but the synergistic uh, goals that you're looking for. Kathy, this is directed to you. You have been life-altering um, personally and professionally and have pushed the envelope in so many ways. We need to replicate what you have done in the world of science, in the world of patient experience or consumer experience, um, as well as all the different stakeholders. How do we help you help others replicate what you've done are you oh, talking about cloning? Or what? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, actually, I do have an identical twin, so that's kind of funny. Um, I do, I really do. Uh, yeah, uh, and that's like a whole other story because you know I have multiple myeloma, and she has stage three breast cancer. So we became a you know quite a, a research topic for the Wall Street Journal on you know why do two identical twins get two different cancers, and mm. that's a whole other story. But um, so. Thank you for asking that question. So the reason that um, I now work half-time at the MMRF, but I also work half-time up at Harvard Business School is um, I'm funded under an endowment from Robert and Jonathan Kraft of the Patriots. And the reason for that is that they, Robert lost his wife Myra to ovarian cancer. And he really felt that um, they were able to sequence her genome, but they weren't able to find her a drug fast enough. And he felt that we should do everything that we could at business and science to combine these um, entities together and find cures for all cancers. So now my life is half time dedicated to making sure that all best practices we learn are shared across all cancers and eventually all diseases. And that business schools do the right thing. Like there's beautiful case studies, I don't know if people know this, on the MMRF that anybody can have on cystic fibrosis. They're all eloquently written and taught at all the business schools. I actually teach the one on the MMRF. It's a mandatory first year case study in the business school now. And um, it's to really help everybody disseminate that information and bring everybody together. So the best way to help me is right now Stay tuned in what we're doing up there at HBS and at some of the other business schools. Many of you will get invited to help me get that going because it's really like another blank sheet of paper or a third company that I'm really starting. And when I reach out, please help me. And when I go to disseminate the information, please help me disseminate because I am not going to be the master of dissemination of information. I'll be the person convening all the disruptors like people that are in this room today and on this panel to say, how do we change the system? How do we change it and make sure that everybody learns quickly? And one of the things we were talking about is when I was 100% running the MMRF, I, people would say to me, I'm so glad she's helped cure her own cancer, but what's she doing for everybody else? And <laughs> that, that made me, I honestly got it, it made me that. so sad. I, I was so sad about that. And the reason that I wasn't able to help everybody else was I was so busy trying to raise the money mm to um, change the system and to raise that kind of money to create a virtual biotech like the MMRF was, 
was so time consuming, I didn't have the time to transfer the knowledge. So I'll rely on all of you to do everything I can to transfer the knowledge to as many as we possibly can. But let me, let me give you credit there, because you have shared the knowledge in so many different ways in, 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 in Harvard Business with Faster Cures. Uh, I'm on the board for a, a small rare disease foundation. We're a fraction of the size of MMRF, but look up to MMRF and have access to data sharing agreement templates and other resources that they would never have that you've pioneered. And so that, that cloning is happening because of your uh, transparency and willingness to share. Thank you. We have time for two more quick questions. Eve Dreyer, I saw your hand up. Just wait for the mic. One second, yeah, one, one second, Eve. With regards to data sharing and with regards to the article, Amir, that you mentioned at the beginning, um, what's happening within your own organizations, both nonprofit and for-profit, in the government area to make sure that there are necessary changes that are going to allow for the appropriate sharing of um, you know, early stage research and data and that we're not going to have you know, government closing down the importance of more effective collaboration in the world of science. When you say government closing down, I mean, my perception is that the government's trying to actually you know, open it up, right? Yeah. So that's, uh, but go ahead, anyone wants to comment on that? So, well, we did a project called Yoda. Project Yoda, which was about giving um, the data that we had from some clinical trials to a third party who would uh, be an arbitrator of that data for other people who wanted to use it because we needed to make sure that it remained anonymous, uh, anonymized and pri uh, private and dealt with all the ethical issues associated with it. And uh, for us, that was a big foray into opening up data. Uh, so that other people could use it. And, and for us, that was um, the, you know, it's like a tipping point, right? And it's like, oh, oh that worked really well. And we want to do more of that. And, and it's not easy to do, you know. Everybody says, why doesn't Informa just open up all of their data? Well, it's not easy, right? In this, ish in this industry, we want to make sure our data is protected and anonymized. And we want to make sure we have consent. So if you give consent for one thing, doesn't mean you give consent for everything. Um, so, and that's, that's why the tech companies have an issue coming into this space, because they don't get all of that context and the complexity and all the stakeholders and all the issues. And uh, I, I think everybody wants to do it. We just have to grapple with all of these issues along the way to make it more doable. Let me comment I, I on that. I think just that, um, go ahead. if I can, the yeah. GSK, j and &J, Pfizer, every big company right now is doing some awesome things to make patient-level data available for completed clinical trials. And when you look at how many requests j and &J, GSK, Pfizer get and what's been published and disseminated as a result of all of this vast amount of open data, it ain't that much. So just opening up data in its own, on its own doesn't really move the needle on science. People need to know how to use that data to do some remarkable and transformational things. And so data transparency and openness is great. Data collaborations yeah. like Datasphere, uh, the, the, the Coalition Against Major Disorders, the Transcelerate work, the work that MMRF does and others, those collaborations where people are bringing data together and figuring out how to use it for some remarkable science and progress, that's, that's where I hold even more hope. Right. And so amplifying that, I mean, the life sciences, so a tech person might just say, free the data, you know, why, why can't you do it, right? Free the data. Where, whereas the life science folks go, and, and it was an analogy of this in academia, so what the New England Journal editor said was, we collected the data, we understand the nuances, we understand all that. You're just going to give the data to some third party who doesn't understand that. Maybe we'll do an analysis that's completely misleading because they don't really understand the origins of the data. So that was their sort of academic worry. Nothing on the pharma side. First of all, you're right. Many tech people will tell you that you can't anonymize it no matter how hard you try. It will actually can be de-anonymized, right? And secondly, would people really have some learnings from that which are misleading, that really can they in some way come up with answers that really are not true. So it's a more complex issue than just being open with your data, just like Craig was saying. Yeah, I, I've actually got a thought, uh, more of a request than a thought, which is 
we talk about data as if it's all that we're ever going to have, but actually we're talking about very small data. It's what's collected in the clinical studies, which is next to nothing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next to nothing about what the patient wanted, next to nothing about their mm -hmm. journey, next to nothing mm -hmm. about the kind of rich environment mm -hmm. that, they're, that they're following. So most of their industries collect detailed, granular, deep yes. data, yeah. and they, they call that big data when they put it together. So you can mine that for sources of information. But people still talk about the patient, the the patient with epilepsy. You know, there is no patient with epilepsy. There's 40 different kinds of epilepsy and everyone has a different journey going in. So let's stop talking about the patient when there are rich sources of data sitting in there or you know, multiple myeloma is not all the same and you know, cancer patients are not all the same. They don't all want the same thing. So I think if we could stop talking about data as in what we've collected, but what we could collect, you know, if, we could, if we could even begin to think about the things that we could, that are possible now to understand and change and uh, monitor trajectories on, on treatment, that, would, that for me would be a, a step change. I know several of you have questions to ask, but unfortunately, we'll have to continue the conversation downstairs. And I want to give a big round of thanks to our panel. Thank you so much. So if I could ask you all, we have reserved seats for you in the front. And as they make their way, I hope this discussion has sparked you to think differently about innovation and ways you can inspire your teams for the betterment of patients, which is why we're all here. Now, as I transition, speaking of innovate, inspiring, in 2014, we initiated our version of a Hall of Fame, which is the Pharma Voice Red Jacket Awards. Certainly one of the criteria for being named a Red Jacket is having been recognized a number of times as a Pharma Voice 100, but it's so much more than that. These individuals cross a multitude of industry sectors, as you will see, and they have raised the bar in terms of what it means to be an inspired leader for their teams, their companies, their communities, and for the industry at large. Our Red Jacket honorees, they challenge us to think differently, act differently, and lead differently. They are creating new opportunities to make what was once impossible, possible. And they are focused beyond short-term gains and are committed to executing their long-term visions in a tightly regulated and competitive industry. As you heard today, all those challenges that they face. More so, they have a persistence of vision. They are truly transforming the life sciences industry to create better health outcomes for all. They are inspired leaders for today and for tomorrow. And tonight, we are so pleased to recognize our 2016 Red Jacket honorees. First, I would like to acknowledge Kathy Giusti. So hold on. <laughs> Kathy was listed number 19 on Fortune Magazine's World's 50 Greatest Leaders. She has been named to Time's 100 list of the world's most influential people. She received the 2013 Personalized Medicine Coalition Leadership Award. She was named an Open Science Champion of Change by the White House. She received the American Association for Cancer Research Centennial Medal for Distinguished Public Service. She received the Harvard Business School Alumni Achievement Award. And she was named the Healthcare Business Women's Association's Woman of the Year in 1998. Accolades aside, Kathy is a compassionate, thoughtful, and distinguished leader dedicated to her family and her teams, who she abundantly gives credit to. And since founding the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation in 1998, shortly after being diagnosed with multiple myeloma, she has led the foundation in establishing innovative, collaborative research models in the areas of tissue banking, genomics, and clinical trials. These models are dramatically, as you heard tonight, accelerating the pace of which life-saving treatments are brought to patients and are building an end-to-end -end solution in precision medicine. I would like to ask Kathy to come to the stage and receive her award. Congratulations. Next, Michelle Keefe. She's an inspirational, highly collaborative, visionary, confident, positive, accessible, gracious, creative, innovative, 
and the list of adjectives that describe her leadership style are only challenged by the thesaurus. She is passionate about helping people grow, and she inspires others by helping them recognize their own strengths and then supporting them in achieving their goals. As group president of Publicis Health, a role she ascended to just five months ago, she is already making her mark on the agency network. One of her main goals is to make sure innovation is part of the DNA of the culture of the company. Her passion and customer focus inspire her teams to always look for better, faster, and more efficient ways to provide critical answers and to drive process improvements. Michelle is deeply valued by her teams for her true appreciation of the human aspect of the business, recognizing work-life balance of employees while, wrecking, by, well, excuse me, while leading the company with a sure and steady hand. With a commitment to future-facing solutions, she is impacting the pharma industry as the business models evolve. So please join me in congratulating Michelle. Christine Pierre, in the research world, you can't say the word sites without thinking about Christine. She is on a mission to give sites a voice, a seat at the table, and the ability to participate in discussions and decisions that ultimately impact clinical research and the industry at large. After founding RX Trials, she literally set her sights on addressing the challenges facing what many consider to be the linchpin of clinical research and founded the Society for Clinical Research Sites. Her passion knows no bounds, her energy is endless, and her devotion to patients is legendary. She is also the driving force behind the highly successful Global Site Solutions Summit held each October. Christine has served as chairman of the board of the Association of Clinical Research Professionals. She is currently a member of the steering committee of the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, a board member of the Metric Champion Consortium, and on the board of advisors for both the Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research, this is when you want acronyms, also known as CISCRIP, and Hands Across the Americas. She is a powerhouse and a driving force for transformation. Please join me in congratulating Christine. And last but certainly not least tonight, Mike Rhea. As you heard tonight on tonight's panel, he is committed to ideation and passionate about disrupting the status quo. He is challenging the pharmaceutical industry to adapt better, more logical ways of conducting drug development based around early positioning of new drugs to ensure they deliver value to the market, not just getting them simply onto the market. He has developed solutions for most of the world's top 10 pharmaceutical companies, helped lead the strategic direction of more than 50 pharmaceutical brands, and has shaped the path and current standing of many of the brands regarded as household names today. He is also committed to celebrating what good looks like through the annual Productive Innovation Index, which he spoke about earlier, which he created to acknowledge those companies that are successfully bringing innovation to the market. And as a follow-up to the PII, Mike and his company launched the Idea Index in 2015. He is not shy about sharing his views on what the industry needs to do to be innovative. And for his vision and work, he has also been named one of the top 10 innovators in pharma. Please join me in congratulating Mike. On behalf of Pharma Voice, we would like to thank you for your leadership, your inspiration to others, and for continuing to transform our life sciences industry. Thank you so much. Now we would like to take a few moments to recognize the Red Jacket and Pharma Voice 100 honorees 
who are with us this evening. An amazing group of individuals who are disruptive, or in other words, transforming our industry. <laughs> I encourage you to stand as I call your name and your character is depicted on the screens. And please remain standing until all of our honorees are recognized. I also ask that you please hold your applause to the end, if possible. Once again, our 2016 Red Jacket honorees, Kathy Juisty, Michelle Keefe, Christine Pierre, Mike Ria, and our Red Jacket honoree from 2014, Dr. Amir Kalali, who did an amazing moderating job. And now our Farmer Voice 100 2016 honorees, Mary Anderson, Sam Anwar, Lori, I apologize in advance, Lori Bartomeu Mayo, Gil Bash, Nancy Berg, Deirdre Bavard, Brian Brandes, I saw you, uh, Louis Breton, Elisa Cascade, Ubaka De Noble, I so tried, <laughs> Carolyn Dummond, Shamel Evans, Greg Fisher, Amy Gron, Lori Grant, Adele Golfo, Lise Hall, Steve Hamburg, Nicole Hebert, Kate Hersoff, Christine Hughes, Mike Kaufman, William King, Val Valerie Kobze, Carolyn Kurtz, and Stephanie LaPierre, Craig Lipset, Allison Little, Mike Moret, already standing, Dr. Jules Mitchell, Carolyn Morgan, Vic Noble, Jason Noto, Fred Petito, Michelle Petroff, Julie Ross, Rishi Shaw, Greg Skalicki, Catherine Sohn, Stuart Souter, and Lisa Stockman, Bill Trombetta, Clarice West, Mike Wilkinson, I saw you in the back over there, Andy Wolf, and Alex, I am so going to try, Zap Zachney, close, and our 2015 honorees, Eve Dreyer, Kim Johnson, Steve Michelson, Andy Pfeiffer, Melinda Richter, Vera Rulon, Christy Shaw, Wendy White, CC Zach. From 2014, Tina Facetti. Representing 2013, Julie Kampf, RJ Lewis, Ann Mohammadi, Michael O'Gorman. From 2012, Terry Clevenger, Timmy Gard, Alyssa Levins, Dr. Christopher Tobias, and from 2010, Vince Perry, L. Reichig, Sir Watson, and in attendance tonight from 2009, Judy Capano, Lori Cook, Sean Urban. From 2008, Leela O'Connor, and from 2007, Scott Ballinger and Jean Marie Markham. Here tonight from 2006 are Maureen Reagan and Charlotte Sibley. And last but certainly not least, from our inaugural 2005 Pharma Voice 100, you all got us started, Ed Mitson and Charlene Prunis. Look around, and if you want to know who's disrupting the industry, it's the person sitting next to you. Get to know one another downstairs in the cocktail hour. And I want to thank JBK Associates again for their tremendous sponsorship. 